Um, you can't count them anymore. Pardon? You can't count them. No, that's an interesting one. Um, Akim really uh, needs not much um, uh, introduction. He's one of the leading lights in AMSAT DL, although he's actually comes from Switzerland. No, uh, I don't. I live don't in Switzerland. But you live in Switzerland? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, he's deserted then. <laughs> Um, and uh, is one of the uh, brain boxes. It's one of the reasons we don't have a quiz any longer at the AMSAT UK um, oh, colloquium because AMSAT D uh, DL always won it. So there we go. Anyway, <laughs> over to Akim. Uh, thanks a lot, Jim. Um, so thanks, Peter, for, for um, using 20 minutes of my 40 minutes allocated. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 think, I think I have to speed up quite considerably. So. Going first of all, um, you you asked me to say a bit about uh, the Delilah two system, so um, I, I'll hold it up briefly. You can later have a short look, maybe after the talk. So it's basically breadboard model of what the um, Howard Long G6 LVB and myself have envisaged for being used in, in on, the, on the ground station. Um, the Red Pitaya is basically a Linux computer um, outfitted with some very powerful ADCs and DACs, so it can basically directly process the baseband of the transponder as it comes down from the satellite. And um, something like 250 kilohertz of bandwidth for, for nowadays DSPs is really not so much of an issue. And um, putting this on the ground isn't, it doesn't make a problem in terms of power consumption or radiation testing or whatsoever. If it breaks, you switch on, on the secondary um, system, so it, not really a problem. Uh, for those who are interested, it's running right now a demo. Um, and yes, the 400 bit PSK beacon should run somewhere on 145.795 ish. And if you tune down a bit, there should be another CW beacon actually. I, I changed the code. If I called the right one, try to find it. <laughs> it can be a couple of kilohertz. Okay, I, I, I just continue. You will you will notify when it's when it's coming up. Um, we 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 have identified a couple of issues with the prototypes. Actually, these are 0.1 versions, and we're quite happy that they work at all. And um, probably the next version will be already the final one. Okay, so going to the ground stations. Um, I had a bit of a hard time deciding on what to talk about because I mean everybody of us knows about user ground stations and it would be rather easy to just tell you I mean you need so and so many watts and that antenna and that'll be it but uh, actually Twitter is very powerful so I tweeted um, a couple of weeks ago, days ago what would you like to hear in this in this talk and then we came up with something like this here, some microwave specialties and some antenna th theory, because I would expect that most of you are familiar with CubeSat operations, uh, VHF, US, UHF operations, and except for the um, experts at, from BATC, um, we are not so much um, into using microwave antennas that is mostly parabolic dishes. So I will expand a bit on that. Um, briefly uh, recite the transponder data as we have seen it already and then give you some hints about what we have been planning for using um, the S-band uplink and the X-band downlink. So very generic ground station building blocks are something like that. So we have a transceiver, an up converter, because usually the transceiver doesn't work in S-band directly. Uh, we need a bit of extra boost for the signal and a transmit antenna and for the receive side basically the whole thing inverted. And that is a kind of very generic thing. Normally what we do have is something like a full duplex transceiver. We still advertise using full duplex to monitor your own signal, especially when Lila kicks in and tells you to reduce your power. Um, the receive side will be merged to something called a low noise block. We'll come to this in a minute. The antenna, um, if you want to do it very elegantly, you want to go for dual band antenna. And I want talk about the transceiver because that is certainly something which is off the shelf and um, I would assume that uh, if not already present you can use virtually any transceiver which fits your needs in terms of intermediate frequency at that level here. So we will go first of all to some microwave specialties. Um, what we already know from VHF and UHF is that we do have quasi-optic 
radio propagation. So um, to some extent, VHF and UHF can bend around, let's say, walls and houses, but it's not very efficient on 2.4 and more so on 10 gigahertz, it's, it's an absolute no-go. So even if you have a, um, a tree in your line of sight, you better take out the chainsaw. Um, antennas are very much like optical systems. We, again, we know from VHF and UHF, you have these Yagis, you have the Elks, you have the Arrows. They don't like a re look like a real optical system, do they? But then again, if you look at, um, for instance, the um, 10 gigahertz antenna David Bowman has um, put in, in the AMSAT um, UK room, um, it looks like kind of parabolic concentrator, and this kind of resembles like a telescope. And these parabolic dishes, I mean, they really work like reflector concentrators. So the, the antennas are, are quite well understood. Uh, for the S-Band uplink, we can harvest a lot from the Wi-Fi slash ISM um, industrial, scientific and medical um, band components. Uh, they are very, very widespread. They're going to be, or they are very cheap and getting even cheaper on the X-Band downlink especially if we are so close to the um, direct-to-home segment, which starts at 10.7 gigahertz, we can harvest a lot of um, components, performance, knowledge, experience. And w I strongly believe we should use these assets to its best because we don't have to reinvent the wheel once more. So starting with the receive side, um, it's all about noise, actually. If you're talking about signal-to-noise, then half of it is, is noise and there's a very popular um, plot or chart of, of, of the noisy sky. And actually, if you try to look for this chart, the first um, hit from Google which will pop up is from Phil Kahn, K9Q. But he was so kind to point us in the right direction where the, where the original chart comes from. It's, it's a NASA um, publication. And what you actually see here is, is the is the frequency in, in gigahertz on the x-axis. And the y-axis is the sky temperature in degrees Kelvin, and it's a log-log scale. So um, you, we have somewhere here. So the sky temperature is already around something like 100 to 3, 350, 400 Kelvins. Um, this is a so-called non-thermal background. So that's basically electrons in the galaxy spiraling around some, some magnetic fields and emitting kind of radiation. So this is a kind of natural limit. Um, it, it, it kind of levels out at yeah, one point something gigahertz. You have here the hydrogen line at 1.42 gigahertz. And um, beyond, let's say, 50, 60, 70 gigahertz, you, you end up with a quantum limit. That's just basically quantum mechanics. And the flat floor is determined by this famous cosmic microwave background, this 2.7 Kelvin. Um, unfortunately, that's not the whole story. We have an atmosphere. Well, not unfortunately, it's quite nice, actually. <laughs> but uh, in terms of radio propagation, it's very unfortunate because it adds a bit of, let's say, extra temperature here in the what we call radio window. So we are basically from, from 2.7 Kelvin up to something in the order of uh, 5 to 10 Kelvins. We have a... Um, water absorption line around uh, 26 gigahertz and uh, oxygen absorption line around, I think it's uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 50 gigahertz something. But still, it's, it's very obvious that the region between 1 and 10 gigahertz is very fortunate in terms of radio propagation. Now keep in mind this sky temperature, which is in the order of 10 kelvins. So as soon as we try to calculate our system noise. We basically have to factorize in all the different components. So the complete system noise is basically receiver noise plus the noise coming from the antenna. And then the antenna noise is noise from the sky pointing upwards and some ground losses like bad connectors and things. And um, losses, sorry, the connectors are the losses before the receiver and the ground losses are basically the parts of the antenna which do not look up to the sky but maybe look down to the ground. And the ground is fairly warm, it's 300 kelvins. And the receiver noise is mostly the noise of the first amplifier stage, which we see here 
Um, I didn't know the name of the formula. It's, it's, it's from a guy called Fries. But actually what it says that the noise contribution, the total noise contribution here is dominated by the noise of the first amplifier stage. So basically this is a formula of noise if you have cascaded amplifiers. You have a first stage amplifier, second stage, third stage. What is really interesting now is here's the temperature of the first stage and the gain of the first stage is affecting basically the temperature contribution of the second stage. Right? So whatever temperature the second stage has is reduced by the gain of the first stage. And the only stage which is unaffected is the first stage itself. So here is a term which is completely unaffected by any gains. And therefore, the temperature, the system temperature, or the noise temperature of the first stage is the real critical issue. And that's why we always say you have to place L and A as close to the antenna as possible. That is mostly critical at the higher frequencies, namely at 10 gigahertz. So what can we actually achieve at 10? So the LNA noise figure is at the order of 0.7 dBs. If you go on eBay, Amazon, you will find uh, LNBs with a quoted noise figure of 0.1 dBs. This is rubbish. <laughs> um, the FETs, the, the, the transistors itself, can manage on paper something like 0.4 to 0.3 maybe. But then you have the PCB, you have the connectors, you have additional losses, and at the end of the day you will end up with 0.7-ish. Um, that's 50 Kelvin. So if you add up now this freeze formula and put all the stages back together, um, something like 120 is certainly possible. The antenna noise temperature, I, I say now less than 100. We have seen in the diagram the, the optimum would be something like 10, but it was basically pointing up and you don't have any atmosphere above you. So you have to factorize in a bit of bad weather, maybe a small tree which you're not allowed to chop off. So 100 Kelvin is reasonable. So if you add now the total receiver noise with the antenna noise, it's in the order of 220 Kelvin, which is quite realistic. So coming now to the real deal. Um, dual band antenna. Coming to the antenna or some theory basics of the antenna, that is basically the formula for antenna design which is really important, which basically gives you the gain in dBi's um, of any antenna given the aperture, so that's the area of the antenna, the wavelength of the frequency in use, and the efficiency, eta. So wavelength is easy, so that's either 10 gigahertz, let's say 3 centimeters, or 13 centimeters for 2.4. Um, the area is just uh, radius squared times pi, and um, the efficiency is something we can influence. Typically, between 0.5 and 0.7, I have to say for the amateur radio people, probably more like 0.5. If you can spend a lot of money and do some beam shaping, maybe you will be able to reach 0.7. But it only makes 1.4 dBs of a difference. However, doubling the diameter of your antenna makes 6 dB of difference. That's 1s level. And typical numbers for 60 centimeters are here. 21 dBs on S-band, 33 on X-band. That is what you can well, safely expect. And you can scale these numbers by any diameter you want to install or you are allowed to install it by your XYL. <laughs> so, um, if we say, if we stick now to the, to the parabol parabol parabolic dishes, um, the shape is more or less a given thing, except for one parameter we'll, we'll come to in a minute. But what one should not neglect is the dish feed. Because somehow we have to get the energy into the dish if you want to transmit, or you have to kind of collect the energy which is reflected or concentrated by the dish into a feed. So in the past we have seen many, many approaches and all of these are kind of valid for different <coughs> applications. We have dipoles, patches, horn, helixes, and the dish is actually only the focusing element, the real antenna which converts the radio wave into something which is an electric signal. Um, that's the feed. And in the perfect of all worlds, the feed would only see the reflector dish and would, would not see anything of the earth behind. 
right? A satellite dish is pointing up, which basically means if you're sitting on the feet, you're looking down. And that is a bit of a problem because there is nothing like a perfect feed. You can get a good feed, but not a perfect one. Um, what is very good, I'm not saying perfect, but really very good, is the online microwave antenna book from W1GHZ. Um, Z, I always mix it up. Um, Paul Wade. It's, it's a real reference for everything compared in terms of uh, everything with dealing with microwave antennas, and in particular with parabolic dishes. And there's a whole lot of information one could take out of this. And there are many plots and simulations and, 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 and reasons and arguments. And the thing is that a typical feed beam illumination looks like this, this curve here, right? So um, you see, and, and the, the blue one is actually what you would like to have, right? You would like to have illumination just up to the edge and nothing outside of it. And this one is what you actually get. And you already see that there's some part which is actually looking to the sides of the antenna. And that's wasted in terms of transmitting. And it's collecting noise in terms of receiving. And there are some rules of thumb where you want to place this edge, basically. If you place it at the 10 dB down level, so basically peak of the feed going to the outside, 10 dB is down then you maximize for, for the gain, which may or may not be okay. What is sometimes even, even the better choice is you maximize for best signal over noise. Because especially for the receiving part, that's what you're interested in. And then you, would sh you should place this, this, this edge level on this something like 13 to 16 dBs down. I'm perfectly aware that this is quite hard to measure, but then there's many um, good um, documents for this, and I'll come to this in a minute. I have been also asked what's the difference between a prime focus dish and an offset dish. And um, on the left hand side you see what many of us have been used in the past for Oscar 40 for the mode S um, downlink. So this is the patch feed from uh, James Miller G3RUH. And on the right hand side that's what you get basically from uh, your local hardware dealer if you want to buy a TV um, satellite dish. So this is the offset, that's the prime focus. If we draw this now differently, then the prime focus is very easy to understand because it's, it's literally the focal point which you would expect if you have this kind of um, concave shape. So you place your feet on there or whatever you, you need and you're basically done. The problem is now, this is now the, let's say, perfect illuminated dish. But you have some parts going to this side and also, let's say, sticking, sticking outside of the, of the um, plane of this um, presentation. The feed is looking technically rather direction to Earth, like that. Right? So the feed is looking down. So whatever is on the side, the feed will see quite a lot of the warm Earth. That's one problem. And the second problem is the feed, as you see here, is in the middle of the main direction of radiation. So there's something called feed blockage. Part of the beam will be blocked by the feed itself, which also takes away a bit of efficiency. And these two issues are being worked around basically by using an offset dish. You have uh, the focal point here. Actually, the offset dish, as you see it here, would continue like that to the other side. And then you have again, a prime focus dish. On a, put it in another way, if I chop off that part here of the dish of the left-hand side, it would be the very same radiation characteristics. But you also see that the illumination angle of such a feed for the offset dish is much narrower. But you get getaway um, with the, let's say, spillage on the sides of the dish and there's no feed blockage anymore. So most of the times the offset dishes are more efficient. And there is a small, um, let's say, guiding chart. Any dish or any feed has some kind of opening angle. 
And of course, the higher the opening angle, the larger the opening angle, 180 degrees for instance here, the lower is the gain if you would take the feed as, a, as an antenna for itself. What I haven't explained yet is the x-axis here, it's called f over d. And it's basically a measure on, on the depth of the, uh, of the dish. You can have very deep dishes, which have sides which go up quite, quite a lot. And you can have very shallow dishes, like uh, most of the offset dishes, which are only like that. And um, uh, low f, to d, uh, f over d, 0 0.25, 0 0.3, is a very deep dish. And a shallow dish has something like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 f over d. And you already see that your feed has to match basically this f over d parameter. That's the whole key point, actually. And not every feed works well with any f over d. So we have these very popular helix antennas. They work better if you have these offset dishes because you have to focus the energy a bit better. So they work best somewhere in the order of 0.5 to 0.7, depending on how many turns you have. You have a cylindrical horn, or sometimes also called coffee can um, feed. They work better for deep dishes. Um, what was also used quite some time was a patch antenna from K3TZ, um, Tim, I think was his name, also better used for deep dishes. And then there's something called the W2 IMU horn, which is also better for, let's say, shallow dishes. Um, this one is quite exceptional because, we will see this later, it has a very clean diagram. So uh, by, by design, it has no currents on the rim of the horn exit. Therefore, the amount of side lobes generated is very low and it has a very clean um, beam shape. So coming to dual feeds, um, there has been an idea from um, Peter Gudecke, DJ7GP, in the Amsat Yale journal. And, um, but he wasn't actually able to properly simulate it and then machine it. But then uh, some other guy, Johannes, came up, DC5GY, um, and he was able to simulate it, machine it, and I think he has sold a couple of those at the ham radio in Friedrichshafen. So, <clears throat> of course, the advantage is you have a dual feed. You only need one antenna, and um, it, this is kind of tailored for an F over D of 0.7, so it would fit very nicely to, to an offset dish. What is very important for these kind of setups is that you have a high isolation between the transmit and a receive path, because otherwise what happens if you flip the PTT switch, then your LNA will just go poof. But 60 dBs should be enough. So things like this do exist. As a short reminder, that's the transponder. As Peter already explained, the uplink will be right-hand circular polarization, and the downlink will be horizontally, vertically separated. So we need basically something twisty on the uplink and, and two on the downlink if you really want to use both. Um, that is also, again, the, the table of the um, leaflet we have produced. One should take this last line with a pinch of salt because these numbers are calculated in the case you actually want to use the whole 8 megahertz with one signal. So if you don't use 8 megahertz of bandwidth but 4, then this number scales the bandwidth. So it's only 50 watts. If you only w want to use 1 megahertz because you have low resolution or you don't want to have, let's say, you turn up the compression a bit more, then this number scales down accordingly. So the reason for the separation on the downlink was, one of the reasons was that we want to avoid the interference of the wideband transponder into the narrowband transponder. And this has something to do with these shoulders you have seen in the um, talk from Peter. If you <coughs> have a bad power amplifier and you overdrive it, basically, you have um, intermodulation products, third order, which will basically generate the shoulders left and right. And these shoulders would come into the narrowband transponder 
if we wouldn't have this um, separation vertically, horizontally, which give us another 20 dB of isolation. And um, this node is basically a reference to this L and B, uh, how is it called? Not tilt, but um, skew. skew, L and B skew, right? That the local vertical might not be vertical, but it may be actually horizontal, especially if you're living in Rio or uh, Penang. Okay, the rest have explained. Polarization. Um, we've spoken about feeds and then there's polarization. Um, feeds and polarization are technically two different things, although most of the times they are combined in one element. And one possible example of combining this is this um, arrangement here. So that is a, one of these um, W2 IMU horns. So that's actually a flared horn with a, with a cylindrical section in front of it and a so-called septum transformer invented or let's say recalculated for amateur radio purposes by um, uh, Stenek, I think is his name, OK1DFC OK, for EME purposes. So that's basically a, a, a sheet metal which some carefully calculated steps. And the thing is now that at the rear side you have now two probes. One probe coming in from that side and the other one coming in from the other side. And one will be left-hand circular and one will be right-hand circular polarization. And for the EME people this is, this is perfect because one is used for uplink basically for transmit and the other one is for receive and the polarization gets reflected at the moon. But you also see here on the left side and that's a picture from Dave um, G4HUP that these kind of, let's say, stepped um, metal sheets are not very hard to machine. I mean, that's basically a bit of sawing and filing. <coughs> and um, I really can recommend having a look on the EME community because they have done this for a very, very long time and they actually pretty w much know how to do this by now. Okay, um, enough on the antennas, up converters. Um, I have presented this last year. This is kind of a, let's say, um, educational experience for myself that was the uh, 2 meters to 2.4 gigahertz up converter with something like 200 250 milliwatts out. For those who don't want or cannot build this themselves, Michael Kuhn has a turnkey solution or will have a turnkey solution. So this will be the phase 4 up converter 144 to 2.4 gigahertz, 20 watt out, so sufficient. Standalone device, uh, remotely controllable, and numerous protection circuits. We all know that we need them eventually. Um, there's no price tag there yet. Unofficially, it's uh, less than 400 euros. So I think it's perfectly reasonable. For the power amplifier, um, these things are available since quite some time now. Michael has something, obviously. Um, that's the, probably the final stage of this upconverter um, solo. Um, then there's another ham radio operator in, in Germany who sells them as well. That's uh, Roberto Zech, dg0ve.de. And I think we have his catalog in the Amstrad UK shop as well. So have a look and uh, get a copy. Um, this output power is in the order of 90 to 100 watts. That's far too much for SSB, obviously, except for you want to use the... Um, Drew, you mentioned the wet noodle. <laughs> maybe, maybe with a wet noodle you, you use this, but then it will be a boiled noodle very soon. <laughs> <laughs> but um, especially if you want to run a uh, DATV transmitter and you cannot run it up to 100 watts because of the unlinearity. So you have to run it at maybe 5 to 10 watts. But this might be what you want to have. Yeah. Well, I think I will manage. So this is what we have advertised for the last one or two years. They are still available on eBay. Um, UMTS amplifiers for SSB, kind of usable. You have to, sometimes they're already retuned for 2.3 to 2.325. Um, something like 100 bucks, 75 watts. If you don't drive them to their limit, it, they will be perfectly linear, easy to use, and uh, yeah. And then, 
couple of months ago I fell over NXP and their suit of RF industrial scientific and medical devices. And uh, okay, they claim a lot of things and I have been talking to um, Kevin uh, today and yesterday about it and they remain to be proven, but still um, there's only one way to do this, just try. And the applications, if you read them through, it's all sorts of things and then amateur radio. They go, what? <laughs> Because you know how this works, you go to these RF transistors and they're all modified, let's say, optimized for this UMTS band 2140 and you have to kind of do some snowflake and kind of somehow tweak them to 2.3, 2.4 gigahertz. But this one is genuinely optimized for 2.4. It's um, 250 watts saturated output, 14 dBs and one big lump of copper. And I have the successor of this with me. Um, I, can, I can pass it around if you promise. First of all, to give it back because I still have to test it. And second, please do not open the static bag. Um, yet again, um, we will have to test this and see how well it actually performs. Low noise block. Also, things which are available already. That's the LNA only. In the order of, let's say, 0.7 dBs, this one is a bit worse, 0.9 dBs, because it has an SMA connector that makes already a difference. Um, then the converters, they have been on the market also since a couple of years, so no big surprises there. Again, Kuhn Electronic DB6 and T, Roberto Zech, DG0VE. Have a look in the Amstead UK office. Michael is coming with a all in one solution once more. Um, the LNB. Please do not open the bag. I heard the click. <laughs> <laughs> Number five in the line, unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the LNB will have an internal, basically modified LO, so it will convert to 10.4 down to 432 immediately. TCXO, no or negligible frequency drift and mountable with a standard LED pack. So I think that's what we all want. And just to show you how easy it is, Michael Fletcher OH2AUE has already tried it with a standard um, stuff. So um, dish, 30 euros, modified LED, something in the order of 20. You need a bit of power uh, because the fun cube cannot supply 14 volts, but you can, let's say, supply it from the side, maybe another 20. Fun cube dongle is maybe a bit on the expensive side is very good, but a bit expensive. If you want to try it first with, a, with an RTL SDR stick, will be something around 20, and a laptop. And if you take this out of the equation, your whole receive equipment will be less than 100 euros, which is good enough for SSB and spectrum overview, and probably also educational purposes. And it has been uh, demonstrated already that he, he has been able to receive SA1 telemetry, which is already in orbit with this setup from Finland. And you see this from Finland because first of all, it has a lot of snow. And second, the offset antenna is awfully looking down to the horizon. Okay, conclusion. Last slide. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> um, the microwave ground stations we are aiming for are a bit different than what we are used to up to now. But I think we can cope with that. We are radio amateurs, we are used to do things new, better, and different. Um, I still think, compared to all linear transponders of the past, this might be the easiest ever. Because you get away with no Doppler, you don't need rotators, you have to set it up once, and um, yeah, except for the um, tree of the neighbor, which you have to <coughs> cut off, um, this might be really easy. Again, a reminder, we have the leaflet with all the key information in Amsterdam UK shop, um, we have um, the um, catalog from Roberto there. Do we have the stuff from uh, Michael Kuhn there as well? Yes. Go there, grab all the information you want, and if there's anything left, um, feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, very interesting. He's brought exactly back on schedule. <laughs>
<laughs> um, should we just take a couple of questions, if there are any, for either for Peter or Akim? David. Um, thanks to you both for a very interesting and illuminating um, um, presentation on something which we've been looking forward to for years. Um, the nice people at Mitsubishi haven't put AGC in the transponder on the satellite, and normally they will be running their transponders uh, with almost no signal coming up from the ground except for the one they're looking for. Uh, your uplink is co-shared with tens of thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands of Wi-Fi signals. Um, how much um, sort of loss do you anticipate that's going to be um, on the uplink signal? How much compensation will operators need to make uh, for that on the ground? Okay. Um, actually, that is, was one of the first things we were quite worried about because um, there will be literally millions of Wi-Fi access points radiating on this very frequency band. So uh, we did some estimations um, about the number of access points, about the um, power the access points are using, radiation uh, characteristics, and so on and so forth. And we actually found out that the dominating, dominating contribution still will be, as seen from the satellite, the warm Earth at 300 kelvins, and, uh, which is kind of a good thing. So. Um, which doesn't mean that we are completely free of any ground-based interference. We have some minor worries about something called space fence from the US Navy, Air Force, something. And they are running at 2.3 gigahertz, 2.4, 2.5 maybe, with enormous peak pulse powers. And uh, it's very similar to what we had with, I think it was Paveport yes. on Oscar 40 on, on um, U-band at that time, 70 centimeter band. This is really hard to simulate and I think we have to see what happens. On the other hand, I have to say um, the designers from Melco and SILSAT have a very good um, filter in front of the receiver, better than anything we had in, in the past. Um, obviously, we cannot show you the, um, the diagrams. And we have also only been given a very, very short, um, a very brief diagram, but we were looking at it and say, well, this looks very impressive. So while I cannot say that we are completely safe from these kinds of interferences, currently we feel quite okay. But the rest, I think we have to see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Any from the, the TV stream? Any questions from the TV stream? I'm getting a... Shake of the head. Okay. Both of you, thank you very much indeed. Very interesting and uh, going to be really interesting to see how that goes. <laughs>